but I did on Tuesday. Wasn't feeling very well, and um, I, I, I knew I had a number of things coming up, a um, number of classes coming up that would be difficult to miss. Um, I had a guest speaker and all that, so I, I, I took off. Um, I feel eh, about the same. <laughs> um, I hope you watch the video. The video that I posted up there wasn't just, you know, a filler activity. It was, it was probably pretty much what I was going to talk about um, on, on Tuesday um, of more advanced stuff with SQL. Um, the one other thing to look at, I don't recall if it was in the video or not, is the join statement itself. There's a couple of different ways to do joins. So we'll talk about that for a minute and then we'll get on to the next phase of that. Um, the one way to do joins, the way that I always learn, and I guess you know, old habits die hard, it's a, it's a method that I'm more comfortable with, is uh, through the where clause where you connect uh, the keys in the where clause. So if you join the faculty table to the student table, you'd say something like select list of columns from faculty student where student dot faculty ID equals faculty dot faculty ID. That's the way that I'm more familiar with. But there's another syntax of that as well. And let's go and, and let's look at it uh, real quick before we go on to the, the next phase. And we'll talk a little bit about the advantages of this syntax. And we'll, I'll go into create a query. And I'll pull up a couple of the tables, like I said. Notice it's smart enough to join them already. So if we pick something like student last name, student first name, and faculty last name, let's say. If we look at the SQL that is behind this, we will see the other way of doing it. And that is through the use of actually the join clause. All right. Select student SL name, student SF name, faculty FL name. From faculty, inner join student on faculty ID equals faculty.fid equals student ID. Student.fid, I mean. Um, that's sort of another way to do it. Uh, I suppose there would be some to, that would argue that this is probably the proper way, that, that the where clause should be used strictly for filtering, but truth be told, both of them, both of them work. Now, what do I mean by an inner join? Uh, an inner join is the kind of join that you get with a where clause, whereas there would have to be something in both tables for it to show up in the result set. So let's, for example, look at the student table. And let's make one student, John Doe, not have a faculty advisor at all. So we'll eliminate the faculty advisor for John Doe. And there should be six students. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm sorry, there should be seven students on this list. But because John Doe doesn't have a faculty advisor, There we go. Because John Doe doesn't have a faculty advisor, when we run the query, notice we only get one, two, three, four, five, six. 
Why do we not get John Doe? Because John Doe didn't have a faculty advisor. Therefore, that inner join failed. John Doe doesn't join with anyone in the faculty table. There is no match in the faculty table. So therefore, John Doe will not appear. All right. That would be the same way if you did it with a where clause. With, an, with uh, the join clause, one thing that you can do is you can change the type of join from an inner join to an outer join. All right. And let's see how we do that. If I click right on the line between the two, it asks me, do I want to include rows where the join uh, fields from both tables are equal? In other words, do I want to require there to be a match between the two fields, or the two tables? Or do I want to see everyone in the faculty table, regardless of whether they match up with anyone in the student table or not? All right. And if they do match, then I want to see their students. Or, the last option, which is the one we'll take, where I want to see all students, regardless of whether they match up with anyone in the faculty table or not, and the students that do match, I want to see who their faculty advisor is. So that's the option we'll take. If we then look at this query in SQL, we'll notice that the syntax has changed slightly. Instead of saying inner join, it says right join student on faculty dot FID equals student dot FID. So it will find all students regardless of whether they have a match in the faculty table or not. And the faculty, uh, or I'm sorry, and the students that do have a match, it will show up and it will show their name. So if we run this, now notice we do get our seven students. All right. And for six of the students, we see their name and faculty advisor. For the seventh student, that new one to this query, we just see their name and no faculty advisor because they don't have one assigned. So which way is the right way to do it? Well, it depends on the specific query that you're looking for. Right? It, it really, you know, you can't. You can't give a blanket answer for that. You have the ability to do it either way. You just have to identify whether the particular problem you're solving, you want to use an inner join or an outer join. All right, questions on this. I think if we flip this around and say left join, it will do the opposite. shows all the faculty advisors, all the faculty people, and it shows if they have a match up to the student. All right. So far in this class, I have been, you know, we've been writing the SQL code by hand. Uh, there certainly is no shame for using the query builder. All right. Um, it, it, you know, it's a case of, um, you would want to know how to add first before you would use a calculator to do addition. Well, you should know how SQL statements work before you use a query builder. If for no other reason, well, there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, it helps you, um, sometimes it helps you go in and sort of troubleshoot and see what's going on. Um, because um, especially when we get to the insert, update, and delete, I've seen cases where Visual Studio has generated a goofy insert, update, or delete statement. And by knowing how it should look, it helps you to debug that. Secondly, sometimes we're going to programmatically create our SQL statements. Let me give you a for instance. Um, if you go to LC's, I think this used to be this way. I'll have to check, uh, or, or we'll see now if, if I'm correct or not. If we go to like my campus and look for searching for schedule for fall. 
which you probably can't do yet. I think soon you'll be able to do it, but not quite yet. Oh, no, we can look for fall. We just can't enroll. So we're going to look for CISS classes. And we're going to look for classes that I teach because you're enjoying this class so much that you're going to want to make sure you take more classes from me. Now, notice what we have here though. We have a whole boatload of selection criteria. Could you imagine behind the scenes here, there's a select statement, but the where clause and the filtering is going to depend on the option that the person picks here, right? For example, if they include a person's last name, then that will be part of the criteria. But if they don't include a last name, then that won't be part of the criteria. Likewise, if you include number of credit hours, all right, or if you include um, that you only want to take it in person or that you only want to take it online, or if you want to take it on the, in, in the, 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 the Wellington campus, if you include, a, depending on the criteria you pick, you could have a wildly different where clause. All right? So how do you do that? Well, you can do that the way that we've been doing our SQL statements so far, right? Because our SQL statements so far, everything is fixed about them except for the specific parameters that we're plugging in. So for example, if we're doing our query based on faculty name, all right, if we're doing a search based on faculty name, we're always doing that search based on faculty name. We're not sometimes doing faculty name and some other criteria, all right? Later on in the term, we'll go over examples where we're going to programmatically create our select statement that de that's similar to this. Depending on the options that the user picks, we're going to change that SQL statement. We're going to have our code to change it. How are we going to do that? Well, the same way we've done anything, right? Everything about uh, ASP.NET is, is, is attributes of a component. So we'll change the attribute of the component that says what the select statement is to reflect the different where clause. So let's see what I am teaching. All right. Database design and implementation, web development, this one. And looky here, two brand new courses. This is one of the reasons I did this one too. All right, two brand new courses, Introduction to Android Programming and Mobile Web Development. And I'm really looking forward to these classes. And by then, maybe I'll know how to do that stuff. No, <laughs> just kidding. I do, I do need to, do, I do need to, to spend some time woodshedding, as, as a musician would say, and, and working and brushing up my skills. But... Um, yeah, all right. Questions about any of this? Um, yes? What's the significance to the right join and the left join? Well, the right and left, the right and left will tell you which way. For example, the right join, the one on the right, it will pull up, I believe this is the way that it works, that with the right join it pull up all the students and the matching faculty. When I did a left join, pulls all the faculty and the matching students. So the difference between right and left is the right part, the one on the right versus the one on the left. Um, the, two on each side. the two on each side of, of the join, yeah. All right, okay. Now on to other kinds of SQL statements. And these are the SQL statements to actually manipulate values in the database. All right. All the things that we've done so far are about querying the database. Um, querying the database, the select statement is actually probably the most complicated um, statement, which in a way makes sense because if you think about it, the whole idea of, of databases is that you have this pile of data and you want to be able to get at it a bunch of different ways, all right? 
we went over some examples where we pulled stuff from one table, where we filtered stuff from a table, where we joined two tables together. If you look in the exercises that I posted on the video, where we did summaries, where we don't want to necessarily see every student that a person advises, but maybe we just want to see how many students that a faculty member advises. So it makes sense that the way that we want to query the data is going to be really varied, right? Because that's, that's the whole beauty of relational databases. Unlike old file systems, which were very rigid in the kind of data that you could get out, with relational database uh, systems, you're very flexible about the kind of data that you can get out. All right? Um, now, insert, update, and deleting comparatively is simple. We want to add a row to a database. We want to change values into the database. And we want to delete values in the, data, in the database. But while the statements themselves are simpler, obviously something that changes the database um, has a potentially bigger impact, right? In other words, put differently, you get a select statement wrong, your query produces the wrong results. You get a delete statement wrong, you've just wiped out your whole table, <laughs> all right? And with cascading deletes, maybe three other tables as well, all right? So there's sort of a higher impact. There's also a bigger chance of something that can go wrong with a insert, update, and delete statement. And we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about the consequences in terms of how could this statement go wrong, all right? And then we'll talk about what we could do to prevent that, all right? But first, we're going to introduce the, the three statements um, and, and review those three statements. <clears throat> Let's start with the simplest and the most dangerous, all right? Delete statement. Delete statement is real simple. Delete from table where, and then you have some condition. You don't have to have a condition, uh, condition, but typically you do. What do you suppose happens if you don't have a condition? It tries to delete every row. All right? It tries to delete every row. So if I said delete from table and I didn't have a condition, it would try to delete everything. Sort of like if I said select star from student. If I don't have a where clause, who is it going to return? Well, it's going to return every student. Same idea here. If you don't say what, the assumption is everything. All right? So I suppose it's a dangerous assumption, but, you know, we got to play with the cards which we have been dealt. All right. Typically, the criteria is going to be, the, especially within the kinds of applications we are writing, not necessarily all of them, but probably most common, the delete statement will, the where clause on a delete statement, rather, will reference the primary key to the table. For example, if you wanted to delete Zellers from the faculty table, all right, the best way to do it would be delete from faculty where FID equals 1, 2, 3, 4. And in this case, we'll assume 1, 2, 3, 4 is Zeller's faculty ID number. Now, why do I say use a primary key? What would, would be wrong with saying delete from faculty where name equals, last name equals Zeller's? Why is this better than deleting by name. Yeah, it could, could be more than one Zellers that teaches. And if you use the name, then you could potentially delete several people. So how are we sure to get the right one? Well, the one way that we can be absolutely sure we're only getting one is if we use a primary key. 
All right. So that's why typically that's done. If, if you're thinking about it, you know, if you're managing your Netflix queue and you want to delete uh, an item from your queue, all right, the delete statement probably is going to have contain the key to that item that you're deleting. Why? So it only deletes that one. You know, there's how many versions of the movie King Kong? What if you had all three of them in your queue and it used the name? It would delete all three of them when really you'd only want to delete the one that was made in the 70s, let's say, because that was probably the stupidest one. All right? Actually, in that case, it should delete all of them except the one that was made in the, what, the 30s or 40s, because that's clearly the best one. All right? But I digress. All right. At any rate, it's going to use the primary key of that. Okay? Notice that, um, just like with selects, if the um, value is numeric, you don't include it uh, in parentheses. If the value happened to be alphanumeric, like maybe, let's think of an example. Um, let's say we have a course table where the primary key is the alphabet, alphanumeric course number, such as CISS 143. Let's say that's the key. We would then say delete from course where course number equals CISS 243 or something like that. And and that that would that code the value of that code would be included in parentheses. All right, because it's alphanumeric. If you did not include it in parentheses, um, you'd get an error. You'd get an error because the database engine would think that you were referencing a column. And because there is no column called CISS243, it doesn't know what to do. If you ran this query in Access without the quotes around it, it would think that you were trying to put in a parameter and up you'd get a dialog box. If you um, ran this in through your ASP.NET, it would give you an error something like, um, I don't know what it would give you. But it gives you some sort of, of error that would say no value given for certain column or illegal column name or something like that. All right. Now, what can go wrong with a delete statement? We're going we're gonna to talk about all these statements and we're going to talk about what can go wrong with them. All right. What can go wrong with a delete statement? How so? Well, like you were talking about Zellers. Right. I mean, if you misspell the word. Okay. All right. Um, like along those lines. Okay. Um, uh, data you want it. Okay. Um, that's true. You do have to be sure that your criteria is the proper criteria that you want to delete. All right. Let's assume that. Let's assume that you've done it. Because other sorts of errors that you could get is you could, you could just have a bad syntax. You could refer to a table that doesn't exist or a column that doesn't exist. We'll sort of include those in our mental list of errors, but you know that testing will find that. All right? uh, you'd want to be sure that you get the criteria. What happens if there's nothing that matches that key? Will that cause an error in the delete statement? Let's say if I say delete from faculty where FID equals 1, 2, 3, 4. What if there is no faculty number one, two, three, four? Will that give me an error? The next no, it won't do that. Won't it won't delete anything, but it won't give you an error either. Right. All right. So, in other words, if I if I say a del if I issue a delete statement and um, nothing matches the criteria 
and it doesn't delete anything, um, the, C, the, the, the data engine considers that a success, <laughs> right? You know? And if you look at it, yeah, it deleted everything that matched that criteria. Nothing matched that criteria, so it did its job. All right? Um, what would keep something from deleting? What would, what would cause an, let's assume we have the proper syntax. Let's assume that we have the right criteria, so we're not deleting wrong things. What would cause a delete statement to blow up? What would, go ahead. One to many relationship and you were trying to delete the one. Okay. Many records out there. All right, the, the, you, you're 95% you're, you're of the way there. There's one more phrase to add to that. If you have a one to many relationship and you delete the parent row, you delete the one, and there are related rows in the other table. And there's no cascading delete. And there's no cascading delete. That's the other 5%. Right, exactly. So if I had a case of this, if I had a case of there's a relationship between, again, we'll stick with this one. Being a little under the weather, I don't have the imagination to think of a different example each, each time. But if we have a faculty to student, and faculty number one, two, three, four is Zellers, and student one, Jones, has a faculty advisor of one, two, three, four. If it is not set up to cascade delete, all right, and I try to delete Zellers, it will give me an error because it, it will not be able to delete that person because, or won't be able to delete this guy because there's a related row. You all understand the notion of the cascading delete versus the restricting deletion, right? When you define the foreign key, you have an option. And Really, there's, there's no way to give a hard and fast rule to say always do one or always do the other. You have to look at the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, in some cases, you know, the, the one key point is, uh, is, is the child entity what's called an independent or a dependent entity. All right? Another way to look at this is uh, an, uh, an independent entity is one that you could imagine being assigned to a different parent. All right? In other words, in this case, Jones. Could you imagine Jones having another person as a faculty advisor? Sure. Yeah, Jones could, no one could advise Jones. Why not? Okay. What is a dependent entity then? A dependent entity is where it makes no sense to reassign the child to a different uh, parent. Uh, what would be an example of that? Paycheck, for example. All right, we're going to delete Fred from the uh, table. All right, so therefore we're going to reassign all of Fred's checks to Pete. That doesn't make sense, right? You can't reassign checks to another person, all right? Uh, orders and line items. The line items are a dependent order. Well, we're canceling this order. Well, I guess we're going to take this item then and send it to another customer because we'll put it on another order, all right? Doesn't make sense. Um, now, the other thing to consider is there are, are there legal reasons or, or business reasons, I guess, of which legal reasons would be a subset where you'd want to keep the children around. For example, let's say an employee quits today, all right, well, March 15th, all right. Um, you would not want to delete them and delete all and cascade and delete all their paychecks because you're legally obligated the end of this year to send them a W-2 form, all right. So, other business or legal or whatever constraints can, can cause you to change your mind about whether to cascade or to restrict. So while I may normally say, gee, that's a dependent entity, when you delete the person, you should delete their paychecks, um, the, the business requirement or the legal requirement that you keep that person around to give them a W-2 form sort of trumps that. All right, so, so it's two things taken together. Um, are there dependent and independent entities? And is there any other compelling business, legal, whatever kind of reason uh, to keep that? All right. 
So back to delete statements failing. If I try to delete a row and there are children related to that row and it is set to cascade, it will delete the row in the, prime, in the main table and it will delete all the children as well. Now keep in mind that this could set off a chain of deletions because it might not just be between this and this, right? You could have a whole bunch of tables with a whole bunch of foreign keys. And maybe if I delete a row in here, delete all the rows related to that row in here, delete all the rows in this table that are related to all the rows in that table that I deleted, and then finally even this table. So you could actually go across a whole bunch of tables if you delete, and all of them are set to cascade. All right. My assumption was that all of them are set to cascade. Now, one thing about SQL statements that becomes more relevant when we start talking about these to keep in mind is that these are all or nothing statements. So, for example, if this is set to cascade and this is set to cascade and this relationship is set to restrict deletion and there's one row in this table that matches up with the row here that we want to delete as part of this mass cascade, the entire deletion fails. All right? So, you know, I delete Zellers. It deletes all the paychecks associated with Zellers. It deletes all the deductions associated with Zellers. It tries to delete something over here that's related to one of those things, oop, it can't do it and it'll stop and it'll block the deletion. Alright? So, a delete along with an update statement is an all or nothing thing. It will either do them all or do nothing. Alright? Which kind of makes sense from a database perspective. Right? The thing about these foreign keys is we can't orphan anything. Right? We can't have a, a table, or I'm sorry, a row in a related table that doesn't match up with something. So therefore, um, if we try to delete something and we can't for whatever reason, we don't want that person sort of half deleted and half not. Right? We don't want to get rid of some of their stuff and not other stuff. All right? So therefore, these are all, all are all they were going to come, they're going to succeed or fail. They're not going to delete some of the rows and then some of the rows not delete. All right. So the main reason, you know, if if you if you um, if you eliminate um, syntax errors um, from from deletion, uh, if you eliminate the, the notion of a syntax error. And if you, if you, for now, don't think about uh, semantic errors, right, where we delete the wrong thing because our, our logic was wrong, all right, the main cause of, like, blowing up sort of errors, all right, deleting the wrong thing really from the database perspective isn't an error. It did what you told it to do, all right. You just, you, you just, you know, your statement wasn't the right statement. But, um... The main cause of, of errors um, with delete statements relates to foreign key violations. All right. Is that the only cause of errors? What other kinds of errors could happen with a delete statement? Any thoughts? You don't know? Exactly right. You don't know what those other uh, potential errors are, but they're out there. Right? There's all the unforeseen circumstances. Right? And this is going to come back to a common theme. All right? 
There are some things that are completely out of your hands as a developer. But a good program is a robust program and it takes any sort of problem conditions in stride and it can handle them. Let me give you a for instance. All right? What if, in the case of our access database, what if in the middle of a delete operation, I go and rename the, the database file? You know? Or not me, not, not, the, not me as the user of it, but uh, the DBA renames the database file, renames a table, locks a table, goes in to make changes to the table, and then goes to get a cup of coffee and it's locked up on their screen. All right? Now, you may say to yourself, well, you know, what are the chances of that? Well, given enough time, given enough people using it, you're going to have these sorts of problems. And again, one of the key differences, you know, about good programs versus mediocre or barely adequate programs is, is the good programs do a better job checking for errors. They don't, they don't blow up when there's errors. You know, they handle errors gracefully. All right. We talked before about one of the key, one of the other key issues is that they're more maintainable. Well, another thing that, that elevates it besides being more maintainable is more fault tolerant. In other words, if there's a problem, it lets you know very clearly what happened and what you need to do to fix it. As opposed to giving you some very cryptic error message that, you know, Gee, you look at it and say, well, that doesn't look like it's good, but I'm really not sure what that error message means. All right? So, in addition, and this will be a repeating theme as we look at these other statements. In addition to the errors that we can anticipate, there's going to be a whole boatload of errors that we can't anticipate. All right? And fortunately for us, you know, we don't know what they are necessarily. We could maybe guess at some of them. But, fortunately for us, we can handle them. So, we can write error code to trap for the errors that we know about and trap for the errors that we don't necessarily know about, but we can kind of anticipate. Questions about the delete statement? All right, let's look at the update statement. Update statement. update table set column equals value comma column equals value I'm writing just sort of a template for one and then we'll we'll come in with an, uh, a specific example so to update, we have the update command. Update, table, set, column equals value, comma, column equals value, comma, column equals value, where some condition is met. Again, like with the delete statement, there's typically a condition with these. What does the condition relate to? Well, it relates to what we want to update. If we don't have a condition there, what does it try to do? It tries to update everything. All right? It tries to update everything. Um, just like with the delete statement, typically the where clause is going to be uh, relating to the primary key of the table that we're changing. Um, it's possible to write some update statements that will update and not use the primary key as a where clause, but more typical is, especially in the kinds of applications we're going to look at, is where your where clause looks at the primary key. So, let's look at, you know, let's say that I moved and got a new phone number, all right, and they had to change the faculty table. The statement would look like this. Update faculty 
set phone equals four four zero oh, five 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 one two one two comma city equals Illyria let's say where FID equals one two three four Now again, if there happened not to be a person with a faculty ID of 1, 2, 3, 4, then that wouldn't be an error from the database's perspective, similar to the delete. Yeah, it tried to update it. It updated everything that had a, a FID of 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, there's nothing that really has 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, um, there is an option in Access for cascade updates. If we're using the generated key, we're really never going to update the primary key of something. In fact, there's a, there's a lot of problems that happen if you try to update a primary key. Generally speaking, you don't want the primary key being a, a field that you change in the database. So therefore, cascade updates is largely a moot point, and I'm, re I'm really not going to discuss that one. Now, we could have syntax errors with this, right? And we'll shake those out by testing. We could have a whole slew of errors that we can't anticipate, just like we could with a delete. What are some of the other kinds of errors that we could have with an update statement? Other than syntax errors or the, deb the database's crashed kind of errors or so on. What's an error that we could have with the database when we try to do an update? Well, consider this. The faculty table, in our example, if you remember, is related to the faculty rank table. All right. In other words, the primary key to the faculty table is FID. There's a bunch of fields and one of the fields is the faculty rank that corresponds to the primary key in this table, which is the faculty rank. And there's a faculty rank description in this table. Now, there's a foreign key that's set between these two tables. What if we try to assign a faculty member a faculty rank that doesn't exist? All right. Then you'll get a integrity constraint error, all right? Referential integrity constraint error. And that update statement won't work. All right. Can we think of any other kinds of errors that we can get with an update statement? Well, we could set a value to null that isn't allowed to be null. All right. For example, maybe the last name is a required field. Well, we can't null out the last name because it's a required field. If we try to do that, we'll get an error. We can't put a number in an alphabetic field. No, no, other way around, I'm sorry. We can't put letters, uh, alphabetical characters, in a numeric field. 
So if there was like a, a you know, year graduated college in this table, if we tried to put A, B, C, D, um, would get an error. How do you suppose we're going to keep those sorts of errors from happening? Errors like this is a required field. Um, or errors like year graduated has to be a number. How do you suppose we're going to keep those kinds of errors from happening within our applications? Yeah, we're going to validate it, right? So that's another, uh, that's one of the big tools in our tool chest, all right, is that we're going to validate um, fields so that it meets the database constraints. Remember, when we first started talking about database design, we indicated that um, the good thing about databases is you can build the constraints right in the database, right? The foreign key constraints you can build in, the required field constraints you can build in. Then each program doesn't have to be smart enough to know that it's required. And that's true, but we still want to do some sort of validation so that we can handle this in a graceful manner as opposed to letting it blow up, all right? So validation, we can, we can catch for those kinds of errors. All right. How are we going to get around the, the problem of integrity constraint errors? In other words, how are we going to make sure that we don't try to assign the value of king of the world to faculty rank when there is no such rank in the faculty rank table? How are we going to keep that sort of error from happening? Yeah, go ahead. Make a drop down box, right. If there's only certain things that are valid choices, then limit the user to selecting just those things. All right, makes sense. So, through our form design and through our validation, we can catch most of the errors, or many of the errors. All right, but we can't catch all of them, uh, as we said before. We can't catch, we can't necessarily catch, um, Things such as the database crashed, someone has a, t a certain table locked, or whatever. So we're going to have to adopt another strategy for those. In general, you know, if you think about strategies for preventing errors, you can make it impossible to have that error. You can catch the error before any damage is done, or you can let the error happen and handle it gracefully. So we're going to take really all sorts of those approaches. Through the use of a drop-down, for example, we could prevent that error from happening. They have to pick a value that's in a drop-down. We can prevent there from being a, um, a integrity constraint error on a foreign key. Through our validation, we can keep that error from doing any damage on fields that are required, you know, where a null is not allowed. And then finally, for all sorts of other errors, we're going to go and we're going to uh, clean it up uh, by, um, how do I want to say this, by um, catching the error when it happens and reporting it gracefully. Last of the three statements. <coughs> is the insert statement. I have a question. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, let's say in one row, it's in a faculty. Uh -huh. The first name, last name, phone numbers, CPA. Right. Let's say those are the right. columns on the faculty. Then in our case, we have to display all those four rows. And I only want to update two of those rows. Okay. Okay. Great, great question. The, the statement was this. Let's say we have a table with several columns. Let's say in a faculty table we have the faculty ID, the faculty first name, 
faculty last name, phone, and email address. And let's say those are the only five columns. Now our form that's going to allow us to change that is going to have all four of those fields on it. Now, the question is, is what if I went in and just changed the email address? What would my update statement look like? Okay. Would I have different update statements depending on what they updated? All right. Does anyone have thoughts on this? Obviously one person has thoughts on this because they asked the question. Does anyone else have any thoughts on how maybe we handle this? Well, let's consider this. Let's consider if they brought my information in. Mike Zeller's extension 4796 and my email address is mzellers at Lorraine CCC. Let's say I change my phone number to 4798. All right. Now, you're asking, or, or you're, you're saying, this is what my upstate, update statement should look like. And that's true. But would this work as well? Would that work as well? Yes, it would. Okay. So, to answer your question, generally speaking, this isn't going to be, or this isn't that much more efficient than that. So, generally speaking, we're not going to worry about that. We're going to update all the fields that are updatable, and if they didn't change, they didn't change. We update them right back to where their original values were. Now, this could spur a question of what if someone else is updating the same row at the same time and changed my email address, let's say. You know, could you imagine two separate screens that I was on at the same time? Popular guy, right? One person was changing my phone extension, one person was changing my email. If I take this strategy, I'd have the potential to wipe out someone's changes. So in other words, a person, you know, one of these updates would happen, then the other one would, and it would undo what one person did. There's ways around that, all right? And we'll look at that. We're going to save that discussion for when we talk about concurrency and the concurrency options that you have um, um, with, with updates. But yeah, in a nutshell, that's a really good point. You actually could custom write, just like I said um, when I talked about a query and I showed you LC's um, schedule search page. To write a query for that, you would dynamically create the query in your code. Your code would build the query. All right? You could write code to build an update statement comparing what used to be there, what's there now, and only do the update 
And if it was really a matter of efficiency, you could do that. Uh, I actually wrote code to do that. And it wasn't that particularly hard, but really there's not a huge gain for doing that. So you, you are just going to end up updating everything that, that is updatable. Another question. Mm -hmm. Both on delete and update. Yes. When we execute the command, it will update and delete right away, right? Yes. Yeah, the the notion of the the question of it uh, relates to commits. Uh, the question that's for commits. With commits, commits are associated with creating transactions. All right, a transaction is where um, you group a set of database updates together, and you want to apply them all at once, and you want it either to completely succeed or completely to fail. All right. For example, the classic example of that is if I was transferring between two bank accounts, right? Um, taking 100 out of one account and putting 100 in the other account from checking the savings or whatever, right? I don't want that transaction to half succeed and half fail, right? I don't want to take the money out of my checking but not put it in my savings. And I don't want to put it in my savings and not take it out of my checking, all right? So, for that to work, both halves of that transaction, which are probably two insert statements, would have to work. So with transactions, you group statements together, all right? And it either succeeds completely or fails completely. Another example of that is if you're creating an order. You, you're not going to want to like half create an order. You want to create the order. If there's a reason it can't be created, you don't want to create the order at all. Um, we're not talking about transactions right at this point. So yeah, these statements are just uh, sort of one one liners. They're going, they're executing, and therefore there's no need to commit. All right, but yeah, that's that's a great question. But yeah, that that's just you know um, to to treat to treat several SQL updates as sort of a logical unit. All right, and whether it be inserts, updates, or deletes, and because you again, you either want it to completely succeed or to completely to fail. Other questions. All right, last but not least is the insert statement. And there's actually a couple different forms of the insert statement, but I'm only going to talk about um, the version that is um, most relevant to what the kind of thing we're doing. Typical insert statement will look like this. Insert into table column, 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 column values, value, 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 value. And the columns simply match up with the values in order. So, you know, the first value goes in the first column, the second value goes in the second column, and so on down the line. Obviously, you need to have the right number of values, the same number of values as you have columns. All right? Again, you're going to have the same sort of issues, you know, has to be this right data type. Um, you have to give it a value if it's a required field. Those kinds of things, again, you're going to address probably through either your form design or validation. Um, the other one is, is you could have foreign keys. So again, you'll use a drop down for that. So your form design will take that into account. Very similar to update, except you're adding a brand new row. Now, a couple of things. One thing I mentioned is very rarely are you going to want to update the primary key. If you are using a surrogate key or a, a, an auto number key, an auto generated key, you will not include the key as one of your columns in your insert statement. Your insert statement will simply not include that and the database will generate the, the ID number. 
So in the case, of, in this case, faculty ID is the primary key. Insert into faculty. We would not include the FID column as one of the columns. FL name, FF name, and so on down the line. And then it would have the values. There are other forms of the insert statement, but this is the one most relevant to what we're doing here. Notice all these three statements work only with one table. The only way that they can work with more than one table is, is in the case of a delete and cascading. Right? With delete and cascading, you're still deleting from one table, but the cascading can cause it to ripple throughout uh, a bunch of tables. Questions? Yes. The question was is if there were related tables here. Um, let's say, for example, what would be a good example? Whoa. Let's say that, that if you had a order and, and a bunch of line items. Correct. You, you would have to uh, insert the order, then insert the line items. In fact, the order would probably be of significance, right? Because you couldn't insert the line items until the order had been inserted, right? Because the, the you know, the line items being a child table to the order, that order would have to be there before you would, you would do that. Typically, that would be a case of using a transaction. If you had, um, if you had a, uh, if you wanted to, to add something that wasn't just like one row to a table, but one row to one table and then maybe related rows to another table, then you'd probably want to do that as a transaction because you don't want it to half succeed or half fail. You know, the, the notion of databases is it can succeed or it can fail, but the bad situation is if it half succeeds. If you think about it, it makes sense, even, even like in terms of accounting, right? You know, I was an accounting minor, all right, which means I took six or eight accounting courses, six maybe, I don't know. What's the one thing I remember, all right? Debits have to match credits. You know, that six courses worth, and, and that's the one thing I remember from it. If you think about it in terms of, from a database perspective, right, if these things didn't completely succeed or completely fail, you could update the credits to the account and, and not post the corresponding debits or vice versa. And then stuff could get out of whack and you could have, you know, you have the auditors on your case. All right. So again, if you think about it, you know, there's really a lot of practical reasons why you want to treat some of these things as transactions. So like that would be an example. You might have a screen that allows people to pick accounts to debit and credit and then boom, post it. Well, again, that would be treated as a transaction, but each one of those would probably would be an insert into, uh, you know, this, uh, a particular table. Other questions? All right, what are we going to do next? What we're going to do next, not today, but what we'll do on Tuesday is look at how we can incorporate this into um, our ASP.NET pages. We will be able to use, uh, we'll do this actually a couple different ways. Again, I'm, I'm a believer of not always just relying on the built-in objects, but understanding it and knowing how to do that. I found some cases where it's easier to write my own code as opposed to use a grid view. But in some cases, it's easier to use a grid view. So again, we'll, we'll look at it and we'll do it a couple different ways. But we'll start incorporating inserts, updates, and deletes into it. In addition, we'll look at, we'll take a little diversion, and we'll look at... Um, how to do some error catching. All right? um, error catching particularly becomes important when you're dealing, dealing with database interactivity because that's a whole 
huge, giant, important component that is completely out of your control as a developer, right? You don't know what's going on on the database end. That could actually be on a physically different machine. That could be on a different server, and you're simply connecting to it. So you as a programmer have no control over someone pulling a plug on it or someone said changing the, the, the permissions to it or whatever. All right? Because of that, error catching becomes really critical. You know, you as a programmer can make sure that if you're adding two numbers together that they're both numbers, right? That's completely within your control. So try catches that we're going to talk about next time are, are less important. Try catches become important when you start talking about things that are totally out of your control, like interacting with the database. So that's what we'll pick up on next time. Questions? All right.